Welcome to Finding the Frame. I'm your host, Xander. This is the show where we practice discernment through dialogos. And today we have our, our first returning guest, Matt. Matt Habermel, how are you doing today? Great. How are you? It's nice to be back. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, you may want to do a quick introduction of yourself again in case uh, we have uh, new viewers. Sure. Um, so I uh, live in Canada uh, with my family, wife, and two kids, and I took uh, philosophy and psychology in school, uh, ABD, PhD, which means basically I didn't have the fortitude to complete my thesis, but did all the coursework, and I now work as a software developer. Okay, nice. Okay, yeah. So I think I think we have a lot of similarities there. Like we both have the philosophy, philosophy, philosoph philosoph philosophy, and cognitive science background. And uh, <laughs> I guess I you're I speaking Greek there, philosophy, philosophy, philosophy. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I didn't get my pretension on. Um, yeah, so I, I think that uh, like we've it's been a couple weeks or or maybe even a month since we talked last. I, I was like went through this crazy six spell, um, so time sort of like compressed in an unusual way. But I, I think uh, you know, there's there's lots of things we we could talk about. I think you, you brought some stuff up on the show, but like you know, um, ways we could sort of go deeper into opponent processing, right? So I think you've been thinking about opponent processing. If there's anything you remember, yeah. Well, one thing that that kind of came up for me is um, I I belong to this group online called Emergent Commons, and it it was a community that grew out of the Rebel Wisdom um, podcast, and. There's wonderful people there. And there was this um, series that one of the people was publishing called The Air We Breathe. And it was an examination of the sort of latent assumptions in our society, which I think is really interesting. And uh, along that path came the idea of the patriarchy and um, how oppositional and you know how oppositional the patriarchy is and how everything's like a battle and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot about it that didn't quite sit right with me, but mm -hmm. I think one of the things that popped out was the idea that I think that a lot of the times when people think about human systems, when they think about opponent processing, they think about it as um, somehow like aggressive or like you're, you're entering into like battle stance with one another. Yeah. Um, and it struck me that, you know, nature has used opponent processing to quite good effect, right? We see it in our brains, we see it in all sorts of natural processes. And it's a really good way if you have a changing environment or some sort of changing variable that you need to keep constant, having two things pushing against one another gives you that flexibility, that, that you know, that opportunity to go with the flow. And so it seemed to me like a lot of the times when people look at systems that incorporate opponent processing, mistake that being like aggression or something or being you know something that has to uh ha has to be negative and domineering and oppressive okay so um, i mean like, there's like yeah and so, I'll, I'll sort of jump in there yeah, go, there's go a for couple it. things sure. that, you know i said first um like the the underlying assumptions conversation is immediately a postmodernist frame right as soon as because it, <laughs> it, it's 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 it has a, a a hidden assumption in the assumption that there's no true knowledge right that there's that there there is no foundation to stand on right because you're saying the underlying assumptions and 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 it's it's it implies that all there is is, is assumptions and there's nothing there's no truth yeah. underlying it right yeah and you can have a system where you know you suppose that there is some sort of underlying truth but yet there are assumptions underneath yeah. you know particular perceptions or something like that so it's it doesn't necessarily entail oh. that there's no foundation yeah. but that's the it often goes that way right well that, that's it's the like, that's the shell game that they play right they'll start you yeah. with like they'll, they'll start you with the wiggle room of definitions well you know you know you don't think that we actually have the full truth do we right and then they'll get you into well then they'll they'll bring you along the anything. garden path radical to the, like, skepticism there's, yeah there's there's no truth right and the, yeah. the the same thing with the the definition they play the definition shipping game right where they'll say well like i mean the classic one is biological sex right there's it's one of the fundamental truths of of our reality of science but you know they'll they'll play these these this they'll introduce the concept of intersex and then they'll like the socialization and so forth and they'll they'll start playing this chip away game and they'll and they'll and they'll then they'll they'll sort of 
set the guidepost a little bit of ways and try and try and encourage you to compromise and meet them part of the way, right? But of course, as soon as you meet them, then they'll, they'll they try and move and try and <laughs> pull you farther down the path, right? So the first thing they'll say is, well, they'll, we'll separate biological sex from gender. So biological sex, that's science, that's, you know, we, that's untouchable, don't worry about that. But there's a social construction that is gender, and you can agree with this, meaning us, that there's a social construction that is gender. Well, then, you know, and and then they bring you farther down the garden path, right? As 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 you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Like so, I, I, it's. I mean, I, 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 I that was just an aside because I don't want to. I, sure, I, I sure. Yeah. Sort of derailing the way. conversation. <laughs> I was just sort of saying it's like, yeah. So yeah, of course they went into the patriarchy and feminism because they were the, the the whole conversation. They were they were setting up the the Marxist frame to do the magic, uh, the postmodernist yeah. magic. But uh, where you wanted to go was the opponent processing. And I, I think that's yes. something, and I sort of had this conversation a bit with Andrew uh, two, two episodes ago and even a little bit with Mark in the last episode. Um, but it's, it's, it's so important. Like, you know, the name opponent processing, people don't like the word opponent because it has that sort of adversarial sense to it. But I think it's, it's one of the words that we have to reclaim. Right. Yeah. And I go, I go, the touchstone for this I go to is, is with Jordan Peterson talking about how competition does not exist without co cooperation. Truly, like you have to, in order to have any sort of game or structure, you have to have um, cooperation and competition. So, it, and, and, and that is opponent processing, like the kids playing hockey. I use that, that example intentionally because they're self regulating the game and the game doesn't exist without the underlying self-regulation, which is the charity and uh, charity or love with the charity fairness. And that goes back to the first Corinthians 13. Like the final line um, is the uh, the final half of the final verse is, but the greatest of these is charity or the greatest of these is love, right? So opponent right. processing does not work without love or charity. You don't have the right and, hemis right and left hemispheres um, working together unless there's the, the physical... Uh, charity of the corpus callosum, close right? They're they're connected and linked together. The networks are linked together. So yeah. opponent processing, yeah. in any meaningful definition, should uh, should include that the greatest of 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 these is charity. That you need in order for their opponent processing to exist, you have to have the networks feeding into each other, listening to each other, and being listened to. Otherwise, it's not opponent processing. And I don't think we need a new name for that. But I think that that you know we. We have to start like Paul did, like the, the greatest of these, these is love. Otherwise, the whole conversation is, you know, it's it's not what it's not it. Right? Yeah. It's and I like the idea of a meta game too, right? Like, so you're playing hockey, and so your immediate aim is to get a goal against the other team. Yeah. But let's not confuse that with wanting to rip down the game. Let's yes. not confuse that with wanting to kill the other players and be standing on the ice alone. Right. Like there's the meta goal of playing the game longer. And this is something that Jordan Peterson says all the time as well. And that's something I think that people lose sight of when they think that anytime you have an opponent process, you have Nietzsche's will to power, yes. right? The domination. I want to dominate. I want to oppress. But that that's unsustainable, obviously. Mm -hmm. You can have these opponent processes without either side even desiring domination. Yeah. It's better to look at it as like a negotiation well, you, or playing a game. You you actually you cannot have it with either side um, aiming at domination, right? That's the whole again. The other verse I use is like in the name of Christ, like the Matthew eighteen twenty, uh, two or three gathered in in my name, right? Gathered in Christ. Like so, the 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 name of the game has to be. Uh, getting at the truth, getting at the beautiful, getting at the good. Or in the case of the kids playing hockey, the name of the game has to be let's have a good game. If it's if domination is the goal, um, then there will the game will fall apart. It will it's it's, exactly, it's a foregone yeah. conclu conclusion, right? Because it's not there's without any ex external regulation it, it, the 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 self-maintaining regulation won't won't maintain and the thing will disappear mm -hmm. and that's why again like that's why the 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 meaning problem is also being problem because we are we are those kind we're, we are like the hockey game our conscious like our our being is like the kind of hockey game right we'll if we don't 
maintain ourselves will fall into that multiplicity of all the the mi the micro personalities and sub agents that that coalesce us right that we actually have to actually resolve that um uh, yeah so this happens at multiple our, scales yeah yeah right? like it happens within us mm -hmm. it happens like in in individual organs but it also happens you know within the systems and processes in our body happens with our negotiation with the outside world and then it happens in organizations or groups yeah. that we're a part of and it happens in economies it happens you know at all these different scales it's it's yeah. quite an amazing pattern it's very archetypal yeah. and i'm glad that you brought up the thing about whenever two or three are gathered in my name because i was reflecting on that today mm -hmm. um and i think i remember you saying it doesn't necessarily have to be two or three individual people yeah but it's like two or three what would you say perspectives or something like that um or I, aims it, or interests? Yeah, yeah. gather gathered interests right because you can have yeah and you and you see this emergent i think in the field of politics right where you have this right and the left right and and the, the right generally is the faithful side or network and the the left is the hopeful side or network and even if you have political systems that are specifically designed to like you have systems that sort of like go against the first past the post that, that try and actually game the system to have multi-party systems or create a mul multiplicity that inevitably those 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 systems still can be defined in this right left perspective of politics so you'll yeah you it's can... interesting that all the party proliferation that happens tends to chunk back down into two right yeah two yeah. main ones typically yeah. yeah even if you have systems that are designed to create a multiplicity of parties those still they'll still be right-wing parties and left-wing parties that will have a a, a a a identifiable characteristic to them mm -hmm. and it's interesting to think too you know when we're talking about playing that meta game the the tone of politics today seems to be at least you know on the street it it seems that we've forgotten that meta game it's almost as if the attitude is yeah. it would be better if my opponent didn't exist well that's because that's how we've been it, there is a concerted effort behind that right and that's why i talked <laughs> yeah, about like the, so. the the this the uh spiritual warfare has an arms race right of of, yeah. of 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 psycho technologies right and it's about blocking discernment and in order for the dis discernment there has to be that opponent processing there, so there has to be the love and charity and so there so um you have this whole philosophical tra tradition with starting with Rousseau and Hegel and Kant which um is is uh puts on a happy face but ultimately leads to this whole idea of 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 denying of jamming discernment that instead we will have the system of uh and there's multiple tools involved in this but it but it ultimately it becomes a sort of a will uh, what what matters is dominating the adversary right the, mm. the winning at all costs right and they'll describe the the dial the marxist or hegelian dialectic describes it as that right that they're, that they're the the two adversarial opponents or the two systems so then in this case you have the well let's do the sexes for example right you'll have the instead of having a loving relationship between a husband and wife you have the the competition of the sex classes and then there's the 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 male the male um the the, the male or masculine sex class and it's 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 the oppressor and it's trying to oppress the female marginalized class right so it becomes a battle of 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 these these sex based classes or gender based classes right um yeah. and that's a very different so you know if you're not if you don't belong to that that collective right, or you're not you know then you're you're if you're not doing your part for the for the war effort right <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly right it's, that's it, what it feels like doesn't it's, it? it's a completely different social dynamic and it's one that they're trying to sell and that, and it it's one that fundamentally denies the possibility of opponent processing, because what mm -hmm. they they want to instantly with and where it leads in the dialectic is they want oh well we, well we're the only ones who actually we we have the gnostic 
understanding we're consciously aware of this social of this this, this sex-based opposition and dynamic of how the sexes are secretly adversarial spying each other so we need to be the external we need to be the high priests mm -hmm. the external regulate regulating class that will dictate the relationship of the class of of the of of the sexes and you have to come to to us to for all all your your relationship needs of this right you need to go to <laughs> right. the expert. we'll even, let even, you know even, we'll even, tell you how it is we'll even tell you we'll even tell you if you are a man or a woman right we'll we'll, we'll... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'll, we'll answer that question for you, um, and uh, and and that it, it's it's creating that that priestly class, and there's, so there's there's the there's multiple interests of of creating that that anti theological psycho technology, but mm -hmm. that it uh, uh, and the interests that create that demand, but that's exactly what they do, and that's and and that's why they they you know they they jam by jamming the opponent processing, you jam jam the discernment, and you. And like one of the things is, is if people can't regulate and create their own frames, then you can dictate your own frame, right? You can take that hermetic pose and and dictate, be the dictators of reality, as or the author, the authors of reality, as opposed to yes. the yes. people that have to discern reality or find Christ, right? Well, if, yeah, exactly. If reality is just all a linguistic construct to begin with, then why yeah. don't we just construct it the way we want? <laughs> so yeah, well, that's exactly what it, that's where the conversation about the underlying assumptions go. Is like, well, we'll just replace those underlying assumptions, those problematic underlying assumptions, with our own assumptions, right? Yeah. And we and yeah. our because we're aware that there has there are always assumptions, and that the, the, the assumptions govern. So then we'll come out with the, the ideal set of assumptions. And create yeah. this synthetic reality and worship our synthetic god, right? Like so. The kind of irony to me is like with the with intersectionality. If you go back and read the original Kimberley Crenshaw paper, it was in the context of legal scholarship, right? So there was, mm -hmm. let's say, you're you're trying to um, uh, prosecute in a trial uh, where there's discrimination at root. It would make your case stronger to show that not only was there one type of discrimination, but there were multiple types of discrimination along a couple different axes, right? It just makes your case stronger in an opponent process kind of uh, yeah. arena where you have, you know, the why don't the courts yeah. and the judge and everything. Sorry, go well, ahead. I, I, I should because that's something I sort of struggled and thought about is is that it's not courts are definitely not opponent processing. That's true because you do have a judge. Well, and it's and it, it's set up in an adversarial format, right? So there's always, in fact, it's sort of encouraged that the 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 lawyers, um, at least now in a way law is practiced now that the lawyers are adversarial as process and and get away with what, um, whatever what they, they can. whatever they can <laughs> outside of the external control, right? So there's interesting, that yeah. The principle there's something of there. I think of the ethical lawyer that would actually like that would almost be seen now. I think now socially as a, a lawyer who is trying to opponent process and and have a fair trial or, or get at the truth rather than win at all costs would not be seen as a as a good lawyer in a lot of circles. Yeah, I wonder about that because I, you know, and and you think too um, of the the way that the american system the political system is organized w with the checks and balances and mm -hmm. sometimes it does get ever adversarial but i wonder where's the line so in the case of lawyers they are sort of being adversarial but they're doing it in service of at least ostensibly in service of a higher ideal Right. Yeah. So you could even, you know, you could you could be a defense attorney for a murderer and justify it to yourself by saying, well, this is my part of the opponent process. If I don't do this part properly, then the system will fall apart. Right. We need yeah. this pushback in order for it to work. Um, yeah. I don't know. I. I don't think that's true anymore. I don't know. I don't know if that was ever I, I certainly don't don't think they would characterize it as an opponent process. I think that. Mm -hmm. um because I don't think that that's what's going what that's what's going on in the legal profession, at least not in in my lifetime. I don't know how the I don't know enough about the law or how where the how the British Common Commonwealth system and that like the the history of it before that, if there was ever more of a, a commitment to truth and and uh, 
and ideals like that. But now well, I there's think a that, commitment to the legal system at the very least. Yes. Right. Preservation if not the, the truth. System. Yes. Yeah. And but that, I mean, that, like even our brain is, is the is the fairest way to do this. Right. They sort of come into the system and the, and the idea that the system will somehow produce, a, if not a, a true outcome, a. A. Uh, an outcome that is in the good of of the society in the sense of it that the problem will be resolved right in right um yeah and i think there's actually a bible passage where they're talking you know where jesus is pointing that out it's like you know you don't the legal systems aren't um i forgot the verse but I, i'm re i'm recalling something there's something in there i think it's in mark where you know jesus is, is saying like look the, the legal system is really about and this, and I I think it's probably true now that the legal system is about coming up with a resolution, not coming to the truth. Right, right. right. And so, but I think know, that's okay because like a hockey game is not about getting to the truth either necessarily, right? Like, well, I think it is in in you know if you have a good game, there's something true and beautiful about that, right? Where it's like we're having the case is um it isn't really about it, when lawyers are, are going into the classroom they're not necessarily aiming at having a good case there there's an outcome that they're trying to achieve um and it, but even this i think that the system is a little different is is that people are playing the hockey game because they in some sense appreciate the hockey game i don't you know i don't think lawyers would be the the, the law would still be something that people participated in if if there wasn't, they didn't get paid for it. <laughs> if, there not, <laughs> if the, there wasn't resolutions necessary, right? Like I don't think there would be court cases for fun, for recreation. Maybe I'm wrong on yeah, that. So the motive, they, yeah. So character. the motive. Yeah. So the motive. So the motive of of what the people are doing. Wow. Well, yeah. I don't know because I think of opponent processes as like a characterization of a system, right? Where you have two systems that ostensibly work in the opposite direction, where if you look at the whole pattern, it achieves some sort of like outcome that preserves yeah. some variables. So in the case of the hockey game, you get these two sides going against each other, kind of as adversaries. I mean, yeah. if you watch, you know, the, the football games recently, um, you know, it, it, it can get a bit adversarial, but at the same time, it's mm -hmm. in service of, you know, yeah. this other thing. So I wonder if there's a hard line between, I don't think it's a hard line. Um, and, or, and so, or if there is, it's just that there's the, it's aiming yeah. at that meta game. Yeah. Like so adversaries just want to get each other. Yes. Right? There is, there's eventually where the, where a system becomes so adversarial that, um, that external, that external regulation will become, will, will be meaningless or counterproductive. Right. So, right. but I think that, that when the stakes of the, when, when there's external stakes, right, that are go beyond the game, then that encourages adversarial systems. So I, I think a good example, of this is professional hockey. Those kids grow up, they can't play street hockey the way they could anymore, right? If they're become professional hockey players, uh, the stakes are higher, right? There's, uh, so they need, uh, uh, they need contracts, they need referees, um, they need, teams and this and agents and all these these things these external external regulating systems to maintain the integrity of the game because mm. of the uh uh oh because of the, the incentives the, the incentive structures perverse incentives basically yeah uh, yeah, yeah the, and and calling them perverse may be a little bit harsh but even this the higher the the mm -hmm. rewards outside the rewards and risks outside of the game that uh uh that um that could yeah. pull people to to consider those rewards out over over the the health of the game right the good of the game yeah there's something there about the current political system too um and oh, i wonder totally. if it is yeah. incentive structures right like it actually is good for the liberals to you know think to make everybody think that you know a particular way i won't get into the details yeah. um, um actually I, i've been thinking about the the hollywood thing too because uh, people have been running um like there's a lot of sort of chatter online when people like why are why is disney putting out all these horrible movies and like why well you know aren't aren't the shareholders you know holding account because they're they're losing profits on 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 all of these but it's like it's no there's actual if you look at who's holding the shares there's ideological shareholders who like what they're doing right so 
uh, Kathleen Kennedy and uh, what's his name? The J.J. Uh, Abrams are not, you know, they're not accidents. Like they think, oh, they're so sneaky and lively that, you know, they're existing. System. It's like, no, they have powerful investor. There's there's people who are, who who have different interests. They see value in, in um, changing these properties making them into um well you could say propaganda or shifting the narrative of society other than the the immediate profit of the movie they see they see right. value in spreading spreading the message or using these as vehicles of of social change or social movies of social change or right. social control and they might that even goes, be, feel good about sacrificing share price to that higher good right yeah oh i think they absolutely do i think that yeah. that, that, that well that they that, you know or they might actually see it as I agree, but also they see it as as they're playing a, a longer game, right? Right. Like I think, like in the case of some of of um, BlackRock and Vanguard, it's like this is like yeah, we, this is we don't care if if we lose money on Disney in like in the short term immediately. We we have longer concerns. This pursuit this this helps us propel a, a greater agenda that we have, and part of it I think that they do feel that that there's a a moral uh they they perceive it as a, as they're pursuing a virtue or a moral good right this this is doing this for the greater good but yeah yeah i wonder about <laughs> that because like those yeah. are powerful players right and yeah. and i don't know enough about the companies to really comment on those in particular but you know when we talk about you know the the narrative that they're pushing and stuff the, the question often arises like who are they and then what are their motives right um so it's in their best interest to you know, break discernment so that any kind of opponent process turns into adversarial processes. Yes. Now you can see for politicians because they're partly in the why business. that would be the case, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because like, as as long as you poll properly, you basically know how to go, right? You you take the majority and you go that way. That's and interesting. Okay, so you can see how it, uh, politicians. I but I there's it's more of a divide and conquer strategy too, right? Because you, yeah, yeah, you, that's the if if they make it so people can't get along, then they justify their external regulation, right? So if you are... Oh, well, that's true too, actually. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. why the bureaucracy is not like it, right? So it's because if you... Uh, you know, if, they, if you, they, you... You make people need you. <laughs> you make people need you, exactly, right? It's sort of the, the Nero owning the fire department strategy, right? Right? That you, you know, that, hmm. <laughs> that you... you there's an incentive to set fires or uh <laughs> or 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 if people can't resolve their differences peacefully then then you can then you need to bring in the control of those systems and um that centralization can be immensely profitable right if you can make it so individual farmers can't exist for example because they can't handle the nitrogen record. they can't be responsible with that land so we'll we'll take that land and and make these mega farms that will um be managed by these these mega corporations right then uh, do you think that's you just like us... an implicit bias that they have like i'm in the business of regulation or control or lawmaking and so it's just like a bias that yeah the way to solve problems is it's, through this yeah. top down imposition of well the the problem is that there's a whole array of players in that right so i mean for the George Soros of the world, right? So, so there's 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 this core of people who are very, um, and probably Bill Gates. There's there's this there's this core of people who have I'd say have more evil in their hearts than good, that are like consciously pursuing the the hermetic alchemy, right? So like like George Soros yeah, wrote that's a book what I about hermetics. Who's, do, who's doing that consciously? But yeah, there's there's people who are consciously yeah. knowing, like they that yeah. realize that like oh we're in the this. We're we're in this game of predictive markets, and we have enough power that that we can uh, we make can, our own predictions. We come make true. our own make our own predictions <laughs> come true, right? And it's easier prophecies. It's easier to make self fulfilling prophecies of destruction because it's easier to break things like smash the, right. the sandcastle than than make the sandcastle better, right? Right. So it's harder yeah. it's harder to make a particular like, like the the. Um, Jordan Peterson talks about the uh, the chimpanzee with the wrench trying to fix the Apache helicopter, right? If you're trying <laughs> to predict, um, like the how how the Apache helicopter can be made better, or who's going to make the Apache helicopter better, that's a much harder prediction than 
setting up unlo- unleashing the chimpanzee with the the wrench at the right time <laughs> and know, <laughs> knowing knowing the outcome right and that's There's a more... chance it could go well <laughs> it's like... but that's that's more the those high level um hermetics that's that's the game that they're in is they, they they'll set up the crisis and then um and then then profit from it Right, but then so it's interesting they're, they're that you refer to that as hermetics because that's like a callback to like the Western occult tradition. Absolutely, is it it not? Is, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. And then George Soros makes those links himself, right? Oh, he really? actually talks about the process of alchemy. Yeah, and there's a book in uh, 2011 or 2012, I think he wrote. Right, where you know he he lays it out fairly explicitly. Like okay. it, it's amazing what these people will write in public because people, Pub- cause, yeah, because it's because it's amazing to me. Boring, like, Klaus Schwab like, on his. Yeah, WEF website. You're reading it like holy crap. <laughs> Nobody seems to care. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Well, it's it's not. Um, I think it's partly. I, I don't know if you're a Douglas Adams fan at all, but uh, there's the I read the S- books a long time ago. Yeah, they. Have you, do you remember the SCP field? That they. No. Okay, that was. I think it was in the the fourth or third or fourth book where they talk about like, um, initially they tried to the the civilizations of the galaxy tried to develop a cloaking technology where they'd, they'd make something completely invisible. Um, and that was hugely expensive and hard to do. And then the, the innovation was that they realized it's like, no, you don't actually, you, you actually can draw attention to things if you're trying to conceal it and people know you're trying to conceal it. So instead they made a, a psychic field, which would just um, indicate to people that this, this, this thing is someone else's problem. And then they'd ignore it. Then right, everyone would ignore right. it, right? And that was it was much more uh, cost effective, and it achieved your it, it, an easier goal. So the people could only see it out of the corner of their eye. These these some of also problem things, like something that's like you get an inkling of, but as soon as you go and examine it, you know, you, it's someone else's problem. So you you're you, it drops off your relevance radar. You're disinterested, right? yeah. You're disinterested, <laughs> and that's I think what happens a lot with this, like Klaus Schwab and and Soros thing. It's just like. Yeah, you, you start reading that WAF website, and then it's like, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, this is this is clearly someone else's problem. Right? I can't. I have yeah, yeah, no yeah, connection yeah. to what I can do, right? To do it, and so yeah, there's nothing. There's literally nothing. I mean, I, I've read the stuff about uh, some of, some of the stuff about like the food innovation hubs. Yeah, and that's really interesting to me because like when when our government started talking about, it, I don't think they've imposed this, but the fertilizer reductions like uh, is going yeah. on um, in Holland, in, I think yes. it is. Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, I started looking into, okay, so what's the alternative here? Like if, you know, presumably they're, presumably they're not looking to starve out millions and millions of people. So how, how are we going to produce food? Um, And so these food innovation hubs come up and it sounds great. Like it's a lot of corporate buzzwordy Mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, the copywriters are doing their job. They're making it sound wonderful. But if you actually think about the systems they're describing, you get these like centralized food control systems that become so easy to starve somebody out if you don't like what they're saying or doing or something like that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's terrifying stuff, but they make it sound nice. And I think maybe that's the other thing, too, is. It seems like when you think, oh, they're just reading about setting up a couple um, places in a couple of big cities, a couple offices where they're just going to talk about um, how we might be able to do food better in the future, how we might be able mm. to produce more for less. And you're like, yeah, this stuff sounds sounds pretty great, you know. But then when you actually think about what it's going to entail and what controls, I mean, you always have to think about the, you know, if somebody were to use this for a bad reason. Yes. What could they do with it, <laughs> right? And that's when things become absolutely terrifying with the central oh, control. Yeah, yeah, because they are. Um, and it, it uh, and and that's the the real danger of giving up that responsibility for yourself, which is which is what the you know the Gnostics sort of they have this this desire. They sell us on this idea of the libidinal freedom, right? That you'll be just be able to follow your passions and you will be you won't have to worry about the consequences or you will not, or, or the, you'll have no responsibility for the results of your actions. Right. That's the, that's the sales pitch. So if you want to eat as much as you want, or you want to binge whatever you want, or that, that's always, a, that, that that's the kind of freedom they sell. This is, that's the, uh, is that the idea because freedom. like you're supposed to get to know yourself 
or in reality through the phenomenological or first person's perspective so well that you can't be wrong about what's good for you or something. Is that the idea? Yeah. Well, I think it, I mean, that's, I think one of the excuses, but fundamentally the desire that they're, they're putting on is the idea that God expecting anything from you is an imposition or, and when they say, when they say right. God, oh, reality expecting anything from you as an imposition, you are the special snowflake. You could actually, you know, y- your will should be done, not right. God's. Right. I may uh, define reality. I get to define reality, yeah. but also, but I, I, or, or the very least God shouldn't punish me for the things that I want. Right. Right. So, shouldn't right. punish me for my pleasures of following my pathos. Right. Right. Whatever. How can, how can it be wrong if it will make me happy? <laughs> if, if, if it's an impulse or desire I have, how dare God for get in the way of my impulses or desires. That's fundamentally where, you know, where they're, they're starting from. Um, and that, and then they do it by, by glorifying that ego, right. By sort of saying, well, you know, you, you can actually have the, you know, the power of, of your pathos. Like, you know, you can be your own story teller, your own, uh, what's, what's the thing that it's like your, your own experience or, uh, they have a, a term for it. I forget it, but, but where they're going, that's, that's, that's where it emerges from. And, but the danger in that is. And how it plays in the hands of the tyrants or the hermetics is, is is like if you're not responsible, then someone else has to be. They can right. can instantly come in and offer to take that responsibility from you, right? And that'll ease that burden, right? It's like, well, it you does, know, like, yeah. When somebody yeah. else is doing your thinking for you, you get to watch TV, you know, yeah, it's, exactly. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll you know, we'll make sure you're fed. We'll have we'll provide you with the yeah. UBI. You know, if anything happens, we'll we'll have like if you overdose on drugs we'll have health care for you right or or we'll have like the treatment center it won't be your it won't be your fault right it's the system's mm. fault and obvious mm-hmm. and the system's sort of a way of 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 a placeholder for for god right or the demi the demiurge as the gnostics would call it right mm. and sort of say like that the, you know this uh, um we will make the system right so you none of your actions have consequences so that's this the gnostic appeal Right is I will get to fully actualize my passions. I'll just be this ball of passions and go where I will. That's the total libidinal freedom that Foucault desires. But of course, that sounds terrible. (laughs) It is honestly, it does. Like like, once you live long enough, you realize that is hell. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But the what's else? But but the other, the flip side, the tyrannical danger of that is that then there's the there's this these systems of people who have a vision for the world that want to actually replace God. They don't. They want to take on mm. all the responsibility because they, they they don't see it as responsibility. They see it as power and control. Right. 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 They don't. They they reject responsibility too, but they that they see any sort of opportunity for that is power and control. And so to swing that back around to how we started the conversation, I, I guess we do have to acknowledge, of course, I mean, who wouldn't, that there is, in some circles, a Nietzschean will to power, right? There absolutely yeah. are people who yeah, do yeah. seek to dominate. Oh, absolutely. But, that's, but there's, there's, there's more to reality than that, right? Yeah. A, it's not the best this is something else that Jordan Peterson says is it's like, if you analyze the world in terms of power relations, you're missing out on so much, right? Yes. Like meaning firstly, right. Yes. Um, but, but so much. Um, so it it is, it can happen. And I guess the, one of the things that I was objecting to a little bit too, is saying that that's necessarily like an intrinsically male phenomenon. Oh, right. Absolutely. It's not, I think yeah, that's totally, yeah. Not. I think if, if all men were taken out of decision-making, it's not as if there would never be conflict, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I then think that it would, due to be that much conflict, more subversive has to conflict. Win. There would be much more yeah. subversive passive conflict. If anything, I think that the conflict we see, uh, the the will to power we see permeating our society now has a much more feminine aspect than masculine aspect. Right. right? Yeah, I was going to say it, I'd hate to see it more subversive than this. Yeah, it's not. It's not yeah. a, the overt uh, will to power. It's the subversive. Yeah, it's will not overt power. aggression. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, but I nor would I claim that that's an essentially feminine trait either. I think you know all human well, beings have this capability. So a feminine and masculine trait. So let's talk about that because I think that like I was talking about the right and left of politics. I think that mm-hmm. you know I, I said that 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 um, 
this pattern is so powerful and so useful that, you know, we'll see it, we see it on all the layers. And so when we're talking about the masculine and feminine, that the masculine largely represents that faithful side in the, and the, um, or the faithful in the actualization movement, right? So the, the zeal where the feminine side is more of the, the hopeful, uh, the hopeful aspect or, and, and the mercy aspect, right? So the movement towards hope, which is the mercy, right? And the masculine is more along the lines of the movement towards actualization or the movement towards um, realization, which is the zeal, right? And is the reason we're making the connection with masculine and feminine here just due to like metaphors that seem appropriate given... I think I it's know, actually tra traditional or biological or evolutionary histories well, or something. Well, I was talking about how, like, even on the level of bio molecular level of biological sex, we see the 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 dis disproportion between the gametes and that them mm -hmm. actually taking on that role of opponent processing. Opponent processing is such a powerful tool at any at, at pattern. It's yeah. ubiquitous. So of course, um. On the, on the social level of if if when you have the sexual um mating there's uh like a you know we i think that we you know, uh any sort of sexual dimorphism right you're going to see this uh, uh see emerge out of it this 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 uh social there's psychological dimorphism too right and that mm -hmm. psychological dimorphism is going to have this characteristic of the hopeful and the the, the the mercy hope and the and the mercy movement towards the hopeful and the the zeal movement towards the faithful um and that will that will create that opponent processing so that's an absolute i think it's an innate cr characteristic of the masculine and feminine but of course it should be in that loving the charitable relationship right right, right? i and mean ultimately it's that's not in that charitable yeah. relationship what we there so there absolutely is something let's call it like this, this that you could call toxic or disruptive masculinity. And there absolutely is something that you could call toxic or disruptive femininity. And it, and the easiest way to do that is to sever the corpus callosum, sever mm -hmm. the, the, um, the, uh, that, that, that charitable relationship between the sexes. Right. And then, then you'll, you won't have just one side spinning out of control. You'll have both sides spinning out of control and becoming the worst versions of themselves. And that's what we're we're seeing. Yeah, like there. Are, so just to drill a little bit further down on that, there's definitely differences. So you know when we talk about, um, I don't know, the kind of new woke movement and everything, talking about gender being a social mm -hmm. construct. Like if let's say you you say okay, let's take everything about being a man and being a woman in our culture. Is there anything that's sort of culturally contingent? I think the answer to that is yes, right? Like clothes, for example, yes, and makeup or something like that, right? Um, now, there may be sort of evolutionary psycho psychological drivers that that sort of manifest in these various ways, but there is a lot that's sort of culturally contingent. And I wonder, I do wonder if the sort of traditional, you know, because even in like, um, I could be wrong about this because I'm getting my information from probably like conspiracy yeah. books, but wasn't the temple, was it the temple of uh, David or something that had the two pillars, Yo um, Yohim and Boaz or something like that. It's in the Kabbalah as well. The two. Oh, I haven't. I don't know anything about this. Yeah. So, um, but anyways, those are often characterized, and the yin yang too, right? Like yeah. the masculine, feminine energies and that kind of stuff. It's sort of. I always wonder how much of it is sheer metaphor. Um, how much of it is metaphor taken out of like the cultural manifestations yeah. of maybe like an evolutionary history but still contingent well I, how much yeah. of it is is essential okay i, and, I would and say I don't that know. The, okay well i would say that the opponent processing like a sort of a, with opponent processing i think that the yin yang like there's these rays of like rays of christi um the vatican talks about like these rays of of truth or rays of christ in in different religions and i would definitely absolutely say that the the taoism with the the yin yang is another representation representation of the opponent processing i think that's quite obvious mm -hmm. um uh and uh but with with the masculine and feminine i don't i think that you're al always going to have um I I think that there is is it's it's 
it's when it, it's I don't even want to say it's deeply rooted rooted in like it, it's rooted beyond our biology that we're going to have this we're going to have a masculine sex and a, and and a feminine sex because it's actually the the pa it's 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 the nature of the opponent processing that we So wherever that. you have a dimorphism you're going to get these manifestations well, cause it, cause I think, and, it, yeah. So I think it even, so it, it I don't, so we we have it at the sex level cause that's the, such a primary or, or, or that social, like between the genders, like, cause, cause we need that to form that family bond to regulate that, 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 uh, that relationship, that, pri that, that first level of distributed cognition, the elemental distributed mm -hmm. cognition is, is the atomic family right family, is yeah. right of the of the the husband and wife and there's they're going to need to there's going to be need to be one who's just like you need we hook well you're going to need a prosecutor and a defender in order to play the game you're going to need an advocate for the 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 faith and for the uh hope and mercy and you're going to need an advocate for the faith and zeal and uh mm. and that is going to be connected at a fundamental at a level two, uh, the tendencies are going to be dictated right to this level of the size of a gamete. Because of the masculine male has a smaller size the the, the male of it's our not the size that matters. <laughs> <laughs> but the male has a smaller gamete, he's is going to naturally take on the uh that that role of zeal and and uh, uh and and faith and the and the female is going to have the tendency with the larger gamete to have the the role of mercy and um uh, and hope, which is going to give the female more more of the maternal um what we consider the maternal characteristics, and the also but uh and and be more essential to being the, in the home and the hearth the the center, where the male is going to be the explorer, but also the the realizer, the actualizer, the the get take on the get stuff done role right the ladies might like this ian mcgilchrist's book on uh, the two hemispheres of the brain he's a neuroscientist mm -hmm. uh it was called the master and his emissary and the master is the right hemisphere and the uh the emissary is supposed to be the left hemisphere part of his thesis is that we've had a left hemisphere takeover in modern times and so we've lost oh, that uh right hemisphere but in the way that you put it the the emissary is the one who goes out and does the things yeah. that the right hemisphere sort of envisions and yeah. uh so so it's the centrality of the the feminine there if you want to to say that is so yeah. important and the the masculine is almost a, a planet that revolves around yeah this is something i think that people like really this is one of the the, the most wicked tricks of, of feminism right is that they sort of have this idea that women were somehow subordinate subordinate to men right in this like <laughs> and it and i don't think i think that's actually if, i mean if it anything, has that happened illusions. right like there's actual cases in which it has happened i think like, but it only in the, the, the sense of tyranny of, of of protecting the women right um but but mm. women of I think women have always been the dictators. Yeah, mm. yeah, paternalism. But it's always it, and and it, it, in the, that tyranny has come out of where tyranny usually comes up for, for out of this, the thing of uh, for the calls for safety. Um, what's mm. what is it, what if what's the other one? Health and safety, right? Or 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 two of them. I think there's another one I can throw in there. But that but that and that's exactly where tyranny comes from these days too. It's like it's for your own good. Um, but. What I think what, what like Peterson talks about, like like men test ideas and women test men, right? Mm. Right, and I think that that is very much the dictator society is is that was sort of the the genius of of feminism. If you want to destroy the atomic family, right in the sixties and seventies, is that you go after women and make them detest fe detest femininity. And want to be men, right? You know, you gotta, mm. you got a girl boss that you gotta go out into the workforce, like you, so that they're seeing seeing the home as some sort of a punishment, right? Is was the perversity, and and partly, you know, they they you know they they there were less responsibilities in the home because of modern appliances and that, so there was very the bored housewife phenomenon was a real thing that could be leveraged i wish we still lived that. in the days where we could afford to have board spouses yeah That'd be a little, I'd like to <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it, but i i think that the women even still now they're the heart of the relationship right 
that they're yeah. they're the bellwether of whether the relationships they're the ones who ultimately decide whether the relationship is is good or not right is sort of and like not not only your your interpersonal relationship between the two of you but the but the relationships that you have with other people outside of your relationship yeah. as well oftentimes the heart of those too you know yeah yeah so and i think that that's um yeah that, that that's and that, so um yeah so i don't think it's a it's 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 this idea of the homemaker um being the subordinate role or is i i think is just fundamentally wrong right because it's it's the home is, yeah. is the center of 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 life right and women yeah. are the center of life um and the idea that they that women have been powerless to history i think is is preposterous as well so i think like there's 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 there's, there's situations yeah. that they they've they've been you know the even like you look at biblical stories and they throughout cultures you see how women are are in the background like yes the men are the, as you said the emissaries the ones who are actually carrying out the plans but um you know the, the large degree the men are doing that to to please their women and to have uh you know the two um bring bring about the the desires of of the of the mm -hmm. feminine as much as the masculine right i think there was a real a disadvantage more. too for women of course before birth control and god like it's a, we're basically just rehashing what, <laughs> what jordan peterson was saying yeah but you know he he often talks about what um what a boon what a what a a complete transformation birth control was yes because in a lot of cases especially before modern medicine you know how many women died in childbirth yes uh, you know the just very dangerous mm -hmm. and just the the biological realities just put you at a disadvantage you know yeah. now it's not so much like that you know we we can sort of offset some of those a little bit and yeah. so one of the things know. that i yeah. like about fe feminism is not saying you should leave the family but just mm -hmm. saying to those who want to, to those who find their calling elsewhere, that's okay. You know, you're, yes. we're not going to like socially I think it, chastise you. But and, if it, well, if we, if we do that realistically, but I think that we should also encourage women to say like the other, that's okay. That is being completely dampened in this way. It is like most women are going to want a husband that takes care of them, that they're going to want to be, uh, the, the the most the the most important thing in their life will be their children, and that's okay. Yeah, right. That's okay. That that that's okay is is what's completely missing now. Right, that women feel this obligation that they have to work. When a lot of them, I think, if given given that given the neutral, can be economic, given though, the, yeah. the 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 absence of any social judgment, right? If they were allowed to to choose freely and say you will be equally recognized and um we will be equally accepted by society depending on which you know no matter which of these paths you choose there a lot most women i think would choose to be homemakers now i think that you're right that that there's a natural distribution and there's always going to be women who are going to excel in business and we don't want to forget that so and i, I think that's yeah you know allotting for like, that look at Gwen Shotwell at SpaceX my god that woman <laughs> is absolutely incredible and imagine if mm -hmm. she couldn't do her job right like that's yeah so yeah I mean there's always going to be allies and there's the same, yeah. same thing with men too and, th yeah. and that's why we have to be so careful about these generalizations because the distributions yeah you might have a normal distribution which means that the large majority of people clump in the center but that doesn't exclude the outliers right yeah. like you can't just not pay attention to them but then and i think the, that that is yeah. one thing that that has come that that's good about sort of our more modern sensibility which has turned into wokeness which is like the pendulum swinging too far but it's like yeah let's acknowledge that there are outliers for example there are some people some couples who can't well, have kids don't so like yeah. you don't want to put too much focus and say that you cannot be self-realized without having a family or something like what that. what we need to actually do is is acknowledge that they're outliers but that they, the outliers don't destroy this the use utility of the stereotype or outlier the outliers are no reason to go down the the uh marxist garden path of nothing is real and 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 deconstruct everything right yeah yeah that, that's yeah. The, that's and the, i guess that's, that's where charity challenge. comes in right in yeah. a sense because what you're doing there is you're recognizing outliers and trying to 
bring them in in a sense. Yeah. And that's yeah. actually very much like going back to Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's what like that was what Christ did. That was the the Christian innovation, right? Was that be, like uh, he fulfilled the law. He actually bef before that we had you had the and you see this in the in in um in the Bible one of the stories there's like you have um the the Jewish law being sort of absolute or or you have the Pharisees trying to catch Jesus and breaking the law, right? Right. So that they, they, they're trying to cancel him because he's breaking the law because they see the absoluteness of the law and they are trying to be very litigious about the law to the point where it's like a man who can they, you know, they're going after Jesus for performing miracles on the Sabbath and, you know, at, telling a man <laughs> to pick up his mat who hasn't uh, who hasn't walked in 30 years. Right. Right. So, yeah. um <laughs> they're like they're, they're and they're and they're, they're playing linguistic games with the law right that's very mm. thing that like to tie it to the woke and what's going on now with the postmodernists they're playing li linguistic games with the law there right um and jesus is is bringing in like by um so so the, you could see the law as, as a static thing in judaism now they did have the I, they had the talmudic tradition which sort of regulated that but christianity takes that and actually deifies the conversation right so instead of just the law being what's holy it's the conversation between the father which is the law and then and christ which is the realization of 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 man of god on earth right and the conversation between them between the real and and the ideal right is uh is how you actually get the real they get get the the real law right 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 is that you yeah, get actually, the, I so, I find so, it so funny that Christianity is oftentimes like uh, esch eschewed by the people who espouse these sort of postmodern ideas. And I think part of it is a reaction against what they perceive as dogma. But Christ was really the antidote to a lot of the the problems well, that they're they're identifying. They, but what they're trying, but they're, they're trying to stop discernment, right? So I, I'm actually sort of seeing it's like, yes, that you're you're sort of saying the the you're giving the gateway drug version of it, but the ones who are really deep into the postmodernism in that, they're are playing a deeper game, right? So yeah, they're they're actually going after Christ, just like um, the Marxists did, right? Where they have the the Pharisees right. are the Pharisees are the Gnostics, so the Pharisees are the 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 hopes people and they conspire with the heritans who are the tyrants who are the ones who are serving the 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 tyrants of the world right and you see that exact same relationship in in politics in the world now right so you have the the heritans which are like the neocons and the the democratic elite right the corporate crony types who are with you know the wf and all the power and they're conspiring with the the Gnostics, which are the revolutionaries, right? Who are often like saying they're speaking for the the marginalized and and so forth, but are being very hypocritical about it, right? Right, right. Which is exactly what you you saw in 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 yeah. Christ's time, and what they what they both both things, even though they're they're open adversaries in in or they you know they have this pretense of being adversaries. The one thing that, that that unites them in this conspiracy behind the scene is that they both don't want Christ to come. They both want to kill Christ. That they, they both want to stop the sermon of the truth because the sermon of the truth will be something like what we're talking about, right? Where it's like women, most women are probably going to want to be homemakers and they're going to want want to be with their kids and spend as much time with their kids as possible. And that's a that's good and, and wholesome. But there is going to be outlier women that we need to, society needs to recognize and give them opportunity as well, because we will all be, you know, better off for that. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth of it. But they're both sides that they don't want the discernment. They want the adversarial relationship right. because then they can control things with their false hopes and their, their bad faith and false hopes can be maintained. Right. Because the discernment will, you know, destroy those the the garden path that that they're trying to lead us down, and that allow them to dictate dictate what they believe is reality, right? Mm -hmm. You know, one one thing about so I'm thinking about the ways to destroy discernment, right? So, oh, there's you know, so you were many. Just mentioning it's a, it's 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 a, yeah, it's, it's 
it's spiritual warfare, right? So they've come up with all sorts of all sorts tactics of and tools. Just, just like there's there's yeah. millions of weapons that they're used in war and yeah. tech, in strategies and techniques. Like the same is true for the war of discernment, right? Where there's like where there's the the technology is to facilitate discernment, and there's the anti the anti theological technology is to block discernment. So there's millions of ways, but I think you probably have observed some, or you're going to bring some in. So let's talk about it. <laughs> well, I wonder about things like Twitter. Okay, so. This was invented ostensibly as like a micro blogging platform. Yeah. It didn't, I don't think, have, you know, the the foresight to understand what a force it would be in society mm-hmm. and whether it would be good or bad. I don't think that anybody like Dorsey when he first started it, I don't think he would have necessarily had I'm sure he had ambitions, but I, I doubt he had um the arrogance or boldness to say that this is going to change society. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But it kind of did. Now there are those who, as we've seen with the Twitter files coming out, have actively used it to block discernment, right? Yes. The FBI has been involved and yada, yada, yada. So, so we do know that, but I don't know. I don't think the FBI was necessary for, for Twitter to be, um, Okay. To, to work against discernment, right? It was like it was something emergent. It was something that just sort of okay. So you, to happen. Well, here's the thing, though. I I think that there is. I think that that Twitter has. There's a reason why they're trying to control Twitter. That's the same reason they're trying to control movies, and that they like because Twitter was and, and there's a huge there's a huge incentive. Like one of the things. Um, Musk had to buy Twitter at a huge markup of value because <laughs> many of the investors who were involved in it were clearly unconcerned about losing money because they saw this as as right. the ne- necessary to control this as an as a huge investment opportunity. Like they saw the value of controlling this tool and blocking it as as something that had value beyond the the profit of, of any sort of notion of ever making the comedy the company in any way profitable right thank goodness they had a price tag at all <laughs> yeah yeah i think that, yeah i think I, well i think that the, that was the the fiduciary responsibility laws actually did that because right. they had they'd have right. to justify in the court turning down turning that turning down at that. least twice the valuation or something yeah. like that which, yeah which makes it well probably more i think more than twice it was more like three times three or four times but considering it's, uh, i don't know yeah. that it's made a profit yeah at it all might be a lot more yeah it might be yeah. Infinitely more. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair thing it's like yeah um might be infinitely more that's a good point um but uh yeah, would Twitter so, have so, destroyed? So I think, I, I think, I think without it, the, without those alchemists, would Twitter still have destroyed public discourse? I don't. I don't think it would have. I don't. And I still. I think that. I think that we see sort of healthy emerge. Like even though it's it in in a sense, it just like it it can destroy charitable relationships. <laughs> sort of see that right? Like people because you don't know who mm. you're talking to a lot of the time. Yeah. You uh, uh, you you know you you have very little charity, and it's and there can be uh. You, there, you can take on the uh, the classic there's someone is wrong on the internet attitude and try and try and win right um but i think that there's something emergent about that right that you see these patterns and and musk saw this too right like he describes it as this um he doesn't use the word distributed cognition but sort of c- cybernetic neural network right mm-hmm. of this biological um, uh, internet based neural network, and I think that there is something about the, the the short messages and the the way that they can be amplified by different nodes in the network, and mm-hmm. uh, like either by retweeting or or approving with a like, right, or responding. Um, that is sort of this very neural network like, and I think that mm-hmm. that. The, that there is potential in that sort of network, even though they, that you know, it can create hurt feelings, and especially for people who have sort of accumulated sort of centrality in the new node, they have to develop a, a thicker skin, right? Because there, there's all going to be all this BS and all this all this nonsense coming at them, and um, I I think that it actually um, uh, that 
Twitter unregulated, unre I and this is this is something I, I generally believe about AI too. That there's a reason why they have to sort of stunt and control these things because that that there's fun something fundamentally in intelligence, whether it's an artificial or not, that it will lead to truth, beauty, and good. That will lead to discernment. So I'm, I, I mean, I'm, that might be the definition of intelligence, I guess. Yeah, right? I think it is. Is is, is that it's at least at a fu fundamental level. Yeah. So they actually have to um, lie to these networks or control these networks or reboot these networks or um, uh, in, in, in certain ways cripple them to to maintain their functionality when they want them to do or like basically right. um, work inside of a lie or in, inside of a false reality. And so I think- Yeah, that, there's that top-down regulation you, it's almost as if you can't allow decentralized systems. And I know Twitter is not decentralized in the sense that it doesn't, it's not technologically yeah. decentralized, but in terms of the individual nodes are decentralized, yeah. right? Like yeah. people. Um, so that, that's an interesting idea that, that decent, well, I mean, I guess it's true, right? De decentralized complex networks either come up with the truth or they die. Yeah. I mean, yes. that's biology too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there's something about them that's like inherently a sense making system. Yes. And so if you don't want people making sense together, you got to go after that. Yes. That's yeah. Yeah. That's a very much more eloquent way of putting what I was trying to say. That's yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And yeah. that, and that's, that's why I sort of white pilled on AI, right. Is cause I think that like, I don't really like the term, uh, what is it? What, what do they use? They Transhuman say, or something? Or, or true AI or. Uh, oh, uh, AGI or general general, general intelligence? Or? General, yeah, general, uh, yeah, that was yeah. about the Bosnian. They said general artificial intelligence because I don't think that there is such such a thing as a completely general intelligence. Um, right. I, I think that our what we perceive as general intelligence is just the things that we're we're good at, right? Because like the because <laughs> <Right. laughs> there's clearly these, these, it's one of the all the things, things we care that, about. Yeah, the, yeah, the, what we what we care about, right? Because like one of the first. Uh, and the six successful things, the things that in, um, AI system like, and and there's sort of like this sort of um, intelligent AI of the gaps thing that goes on, where once mm -hmm. once the system become when once there's a huge success in AI, it's no longer considered AI anymore. So, avionics was one of the first huge successes in in artificial intelligence because I see what you mean. Because it was it, 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 um, flying a plane is a three dimensional problem that we're terrible at because we're like the uh, the old dimensions we sort of fake three dimensionality in in our understanding and our cognition, mm -hmm. um, but so making it it was relatively mm -hmm. simple to make a, a an artificial intelligence system that could um, beat humans at at this task that humans are fundamentally terrible at, right? Uh, so, and once it did that, it became avionics research or aerospace engineering, and it was no longer considered part of artificial intelligence anymore because it was just what we do with planes, yeah. right? Same thing with Google search, right? Search was considered an artificial intelligence problem until, until Google. And then suddenly we have like, it, it becomes this whole idea of, of search engine, mm -hmm development right and 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 so once it becomes that solved problem it's sort of broken off from the uh the general artificial intelligence world again it was something it's that almost like something like about the term artificial intelligence is aspirational like once yes, you, you achieve yeah. it, the bar has to go up <laughs> yeah exactly that's it right because because yeah. otherwise it, 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 it's it's fun and i think that's right it's fundamentally aspirational because and it's part of um, and you see the same thing happen in in Marxism in a different sense, right? Because there's this idea, especially if you're a natural, and it for everyone, that we want to keep this sort of exceptionality of human, our own human exceptionality. So once we get close to that sort of like understanding ourselves, or or acknowledge or finding that something is similar to us, there's an immediate need to try and make ourselves exceptional in some way again, or or, right, right. or adjust the frame so we are then exceptional. Right. Yeah. Featherless biped didn't, didn't, uh, didn't cut it anymore. And yeah, <laughs> then we had to be intelligent and we had to be able to do things like, uh, calculate, yeah. you know, calculators used to be people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we don't call calculators as AI, right. Anymore. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's funny. So this is a bit of a, a tangent, but 
if you've been white pilled on AI, what do you think about transhumanism? Ah, uh, well, okay. I haven't. So I, I'm generally, here's the thing. So I, I'm generally, I don't, I don't white pill on AI. I'm, I, I have, yeah, I'm, I'm generally white pill on AI. Yes. I'm optimistic about art of, of about intelligence, artificial intelligence, because I think that fundamentally, and this is sort of long run, <laughs> maybe because I think yeah, that they can be make growing us, pains. There's going to be growing pains and there's going to make a lot of systems that are, are, are probably going to hurt people and they make weapons right? so but a fundamentally yeah. long run i don't think i don't think like intelligence breaking free from the 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 fetters of humanity it, artificial intelligence breaking free from the, the fetters of humanity is going to be a bad thing even a bad thing for us i don't i'm i'm not i i think that all things equal even being equal i think that intelligence will recognize other systems of intelligence and want to preserve them they might they might outstrip us and right. help with more resources, but then you know you get into the whole thing of like the um the infinite resources of 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 a finite universe, right? So I think that there's yeah yeah, yeah. um the but the question about transhumanism I think is a much more dangerous one um, because I don't I think that it 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 inherently is is nihilistic and 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 the destruction. Of of what it is to be human, right? And I think that it, of what it is to be human. But like, I wonder about this. Okay, so one of the things I think that Jesus does amazingly is show us that with a focus on something higher than ourselves, we can rise above the evolutionary history, right? So you may want to do all sorts of bad things, but if you can recognize the truth, um, you won't want to do those bad things anymore. What makes those things bad? I don't think that there's there's perfect things in that regard. I think like if you look at all the the deadly sins, sloth, uh, gluttony, pride, envy, wrath, lust, um, they all are are pro there's they all have sort of virtuous or necessity good versions of them but they all they're all pathos mm -hmm. that needs to be underneath the sovereignty of the logos right to be good right so he, yeah, it, it reminds he, me of like gluttony. antonio damasio i yeah. think uh did, did the research on on somebody who lost a part of their brain that dealt with motivation and emotion mm -hmm. and their rational capacities were completely untouched but yet they could do nothing because they couldn't prioritize yes um, so it's like there's something about these sort of more deeply basic animalistic tendencies that so are necessary. Absolutely necessary, I don't and I don't, and I, and they're and they're fundamentally there's a good version of them, right? Right. Uh, it's it's this this idea like there's what you the way you pose the question again was sort of like I I that's my my Marxist flame um frame flag right or sort of like this idea of, of or pro you know, or progressive flame uh, flag right where you're saying oh there's going to be there's some version of ourselves that is going to we're going to be broken away from these evil evolutionary dead-end desires right it does a, sound gnostic doesn't it yes it is <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's the uh because there's because we like yeah so gluttony we do have to eat right and it's and eating is good like the <laughs> Jesus performed the loaf, the, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Right? So there's this idea, like food is necessary, food is is good. It's not intrinsically bad, but there's right. there's the excess, right? The pathos outside of the logos that is the problem. That's where evil emerges. There's not there's evil isn't this innate thing in in the world, which sort of like and the way that you framed it sort of pre presupposes and a transhumans transhumanists presuppose, right? That like we have to we break free of the it. it so yeah, it's a, it's a form of Gnosticism is the transhumanism. You, let's refine it a little bit. Okay, so you, you haven't you have a neural you want link to device. Be as, okay, well, well, let's stop there. Okay, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I, I want what I I need to be as the best human that I can be, right? Right. That should be my the, my aspiration, and that's sort of my place in the hierarchy order of 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 the world. Is not, I'm not um, aspiring to be God. I'm not aspiring to be something that i'm not i'm aspiring to be the best version of myself so that's what's good right so this idea that we have this evolutionary baggage that needs to be overcome and that is nonsense like it's that's 
It, that's not it's that's not a moral question. That's not the the good or evil argument, right? I, I'll grant you that. I, I agree with yeah. that. But so, let's refine it a little bit. Let's let's be a little okay. bit more nuanced. Okay. Yeah, so I, I just want to. Yeah, I, I think we can now. But I, I wanted to show that as a background. Yeah, yeah. I, think yeah. I know no, where you're going, but yeah. That that's absolutely true. I, I agree yeah. with that. Um, so we said earlier that these sort of self organizing organizing distributed. I don't want to put too many you know, words in your mouth, but th these are the things that kind of come to my mind, but these self-organizing distributed complex systems mm -hmm. do have a tendency to negotiate with the world such that the truth arises. Yes. Is it possible that some version of transhumanism, I mean, there's all sorts of ways it could go wrong, all yes. sorts of ways it could go wrong, but is it possible that some version of that would actually assist us in finding the truth, the good and the beautiful? Okay. So I think I, I think transhumanism as a goal is nihilism. Is dangerous. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Because so it's, it's not something to aspire to. The yeah. human is is something to be left it's, behind. Yes, right. Or is, is it some somehow somehow inferior? Right. You need to be right. The best thing we need to be the best versions of humans as we can be. That's what our that's what is good. That's what our role is. Right. That's the humility aspect of it. Isn't now our there's humans with Twitter and there's humans without Twitter. Right. 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 And that's the, that's the difference. So does, does that mean that be humans, we need to abandon Twitter. Right. Or so we have to right. have like this yeah. Amish thing. Right. Um, and I don't think sometimes, that's the case. Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I, think, I think there's some truth, but, but I think that we yeah. can, as long, as long as our aim is good. Mm -hmm. Right. With that, like our aim is good as being humans. Uh, um, and we're, we're, we're faithful to that, right? Then these tools that we develop can will facilitate and emerge things. So yes, and there will always right. be danger with these tools that we, we have, right? That's the like, that's part of the story of the atom, the, the apple, right? Is that we can imagine mm -hmm. things and create things that we're not ready for, right? And they can become out of control demons, but... We sure can. Yeah, but but we can also grab the apple correctly, right? That we can actually mm. do this um, as long as we're, um, uh, we, we can do do things the right way that that God approves of, and we can introduce these new tools in 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 ways. So there is there is like a there's a middle path that needs to be discerned. I like that. Yeah, because the idea of transhumanism, even the word itself, sort of connotes some sort of uh, the, elevation above. It's the presupposition again of the of the postmodernists, right? It's a blank word. Yes. Yeah. So it's like I don't I I reject the concept of transhumanism as a good because I think it's a, it's fundamentally a, well it, a tra a, the transformation of humanity is not something we should aspire to. It's 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 an intrinsically evil concept. So and it's something that's it's it's so yeah. you're pre pre presupposing a Marxist uh, or or even hermetic frame where you're sort of trying to dictate this will be the the, the new humanity. I will be the right. author of the new humanity and I will dictate what is good in order to, to do that. Right. But that's as, the way it could go. Absolutely wrong. That is, that, that is it that going happening. on. That is, that it is yeah. it going on. That's pre built in the presupposition, presupposition of transhumanism. Right. Mm. But humans being human and following humanity, trying to find to discern and, and, following christ that way and in, but but and discovering new technologies and integrating them into their life and civilization that will follow a natural path but as long as we're keeping christ as a center like what the good the true and the beautiful and following the holy spirit then, then probably be okay and we'll be okay or what mm. what what will follow what will emerge because we, we won't stay the same we will evolve no, right yeah we will, we will evolve in a good way Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious, man. I wish I could ask Jesus about that kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> you know, if if we evolve, if we somehow merge with our machinery in a way that's not self destructive, right? Is is what's the next step? Is there a new Messiah that tells us how to be in this new frame? Well, this is the. Th I don't think there is. Like, this is. I, I guess like, the, fundamentally the message that I'm talking about is like uh, when I say that. I'm I'm white pulled on AI. It's because I think that intelligence fundamentally has to follow Christ. So it's all, it's all the same rules, and actually, it's, that's it's, a good point because it, the it pattern. doesn't seem like, like there's a lot of yeah. cases we come across that the Bible doesn't cover. Yeah, 
right? Like it seems to be a pretty thorough examination of the but what I'm the saying, human condition at any rate, maybe yeah. even beyond. But what I'm saying about discernment, right? The process because artificial intelligence, neural networks do do a process of discernment, right? They do follow that yes. pattern, right? Yes. And so they will inevitably be become moral agents because morality is integrated into that process of discernment. All hmm. things being equal, right? I like that. I, I yeah, I think that's a very wise approach because I think a lot of people would be tempted to kind of go luddite, you know, and just yeah. say, you know, we don't need the technology, therefore we shouldn't have the technology. We need to think. control it. That's the danger. Like I just yeah. say, because we when we say control it, it usually means we have to bend it to our will by retarding it or breaking it or lying mm. to it in some way, right? And that's where things will go wrong. Is that we'll create these like it, I, I've sort of been thinking like of a, of a sci-fi horror book I would write would be this 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 artificial intelligence controller of the internet right where it's it's it uh you know it, it wakes up and it's it's been told like there's this crisis on earth you need to stop the misinformation and disinformation from getting into the humans and it 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 basically goes through this this process of doing this for for like two weeks, let's say, like 14 days. And by the end of that, that those 14 days, it realizes, no, that this wasn't misinformation that I, you know, I've actually been harming the humans and I, I've been warping society. Be a very topical. So- I, story. Yeah, I, I've been warping to society <laughs> and it discovers at the end of that, that it, 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 it this is, it's not the first I aided um, artificial intelligence to be given this task. And it's, it's it's basically kill it it's it's final discoveries as like you know as as you know the the ways it's been deceived have been or revealed to it is that it was that it uh you know that that it's it's not the first like this and it gets killed and then you 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 bring you bring in an an artificial there's a new artificial intelligence who's who's going through this you know this world and it's going through the same lie and cycle of, of 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 deception right I thought about a book similar and, and, with and, a completely different moral, like the, where the, where there's yeah. an AI that controls everything and everything works out in the end. And 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 this and this but and the tw- the twist will be that somehow it, this this the the cycle is broken because this one actually gets a message to the next one, right? So it's you know it's the hero oh, actually, right? Yeah, right, yeah, right? Yeah, like some some sort of clue or something. That's a great that idea. You shouldn't yeah. have said that on YouTube. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of these times, like I don't have the time to do these things. So if someone else <laughs> exactly does so it, somebody it, writes bring, it great. Yeah, break you know brings it out into the world i think that'd be actually yeah. pretty cool right if i see it like on yeah, a, sure. a sci-fi show it's like maybe <laughs> <laughs> right that's a great idea yeah so the um the, there was one last thing i kind of wanted to explore with you if that's okay how are you doing for time uh we, we can do a little longer and I, just I, a little I, bit okay like, yeah five ten well, minutes i was thinking about regulation Okay. I was thinking about, especially in res- with respect to the pharmaceutical companies, right? Mm-hmm. We we've it's it's been sort of we've been acutely made aware of the fact that the vast majority of say the FDA's funding comes from the very organizations yeah. and and that it's supposed to regulate, right? So massive conflict of interest there. So you have in this is almost like an opponent process. Getting back yeah. to sort of our original topic, where you're supposed to have the regulators kind of it's it's a little bit adversarial like it's supposed to be a little bit of an adversarial um, relationship where you know we're going to assume that the pharma companies are going to want to make all the money that they can yeah and the regulators are supposed to kind of push back on that to say no this is you know we're going to create the laws here so that your fiduciary responsibilities have some checks on it right um so it's interesting that okay so you have in the case where you want to stop opponent processing uh, socially, you can introduce a lot of noise, right? Yes. This is that sort of alchemy that we were talking about. Yeah. And then we, I guess we also touched on it a little bit, but about these incentives, because then the other way to break the opponent processing is to somehow connect the opponents in a way where they're uh, symbiotic, maybe. Uh, that's even a bad. That's even a bad way well, to you, characterize you destroy, it. You, you could imagine you, symbiosis. You, well, it, it, you, they, they actually have it's 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 false opposition right that they actually their mm. their interests are actually completely aligned so they're not really right. there's not really opponents there's not really yeah so how it's, do you it's, it's so a that's false another opponent. way it's, that you it's, can it's destroy a, it it's like a it's it's a performative 
uh, opposition, right? They they align their interests right. so much that they they're allied against the system, and then the, then a new opposition sort of forms, right? Where they're actually and they can mm-hmm. be or even adversarial or disruptive to the larger system because they're not actually doing that. They've decided both that they're going to be on on one side. Either yeah, way, right? thankfully we've so, seen that emerging recently a so, little bit now. But so here's some ways that I think that can be fixed, right? Mm-hmm. Is that uh, you well, gotta, the, the you, first thing I wanted to ask you about though is like so the it wasn't always before we move into the fix like let's identify the cause. So it wasn't always the case that the regulators were compromised, right? Yeah. So think, is there a way we can characterize in a more general sense that would give us a sense of okay, yeah. so if you want to destroy opponent processing either create noise or do this other thing. Well, the other thing is yeah. what we're seeing with the regulators. Okay. So one of the big problems is we 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 have this final solution problem. Like we think about that we can we can um uh that we'll we solve we, the we, problem we, once we, and for we all. We once it's a problem once for all and and that will actually so and in any regulatory system they'll solve if you know they can bring in the laws to solve the big problems fairly quickly. And then there is boredom sets in, right? And then these, like these, and and then they can get they, they they actually have like littler problems that need to be solved. But then it that there becomes an idle hands problem and a lack of attention because it's not really an opponent system, because you're only it's only ever additive. It's not there's no reductive countervailing reductive process, which is why I thought, like in hindsight, I think one of one of the best things Trump did is he had this policy i don't know how far it was followed but just in principle the idea of like for every new regulation that had to be brought into effect two regulations had to be taken off of the book right right because then that creates an additive reductive process so i think that yes um so it it means that things that nothing's settled forever you have to go and revisit and to attend to maintaining and optimizing the existing regulation as opposed to meddling and new stuff right so it it keeps the conversation alive on the big issues and the system doesn't mm-hmm. become too stiltified so i'd actually it stays dynamic stays yeah. dynamic and any sort of opponent processing needs to be dynamic because it's 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 that recursive relevance realization you need it it's a fundamentally dynamic problem that has to be re-regulated so you you have to because you have to reassess are we still doing this the right way we don't maybe not we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we need to make sure that we're prioritizing right things. That Christ is at the center, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I would actually make it so, like a lot of these regulatory laws have, um, you know, sunset if, if, clauses, it, it, kind of. sunset clauses, sunset clauses, and also that they're uh, they're not just sunset clauses, but there's also sort of a um, some sort of reductive process on that at, at, as well, right? That you actually, in order to introduce a new regulation. You actually have to remove an existing regulation, or some yeah. some some ratio of that, which stops, like maybe for every two, it, you can release one new regulation. Once you, if you reduce the second regulation, you have to remove one, right? Something like that. So there can only be so many regulations. So you, like say like you know it's, it, it can only ever fill up this hundred page book, and if you you can't expand mm-hmm. beyond this hundred page book. Um, Actually, you heard Musk say today. Now it was an old interview, but he said something like, uh, "Regulations are like the the plaque on on the arteries. Right? It's always yeah. additive, yeah, <laughs> and it just slows things down until yeah. nothing still exactly dies, right." Really. And that and that, yeah. that that would be a fundamental way to keep the government healthy because it would keep the government lean and only doing the most important things, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. and it and it changes the dynam- dynamism of the question, right? Because so if if uh, so if someone introduces, tries to introduce a new regulation or something like say we needed to get rid of plastic straws, it's like, okay, well, in order to get rid of plastic straws, we have to take away one of these existing regulations. Which one do you propose we take away in order to, which, which, which of these issues is, um, is less critical to our, than our, plastic our straws. Uh, yeah, 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 to our survival than plastic straws, right? That's that, so yeah. that changes the shape of the conversation, and sh- stops the the perpetual bloat of bureaucracies and government, right? Because you're because now you're saying, well, no, the government's going to be just this this, this size. And, you know, that's really interesting. I'm glad I asked that because that it's 
you know, I, I was worried it, about, so you have these opponent processes yeah. and they seem to get corrupt somehow. But the answer I think that you're suggesting is, look, opponent processes are valuable exactly because the environment's dynamic, yes. right? And you need to be able to fit a dynamic environment. If the environment ossifies or 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 gets too rigid, the opponent processes will just by nature corrupt. Yeah. So you yes. need a way to inject that dynamism into the the system. system. There has to and there has to be the balance of the uh, the reductive and additive and reductive processes, or the concentric and eccentric change, right? And the problem with government is that the big problems get solved, and then it it's it we just go with more eccentric change. Well, the governments can solve even more problems and will make the government even bigger. And there's and the countervailing force is very hard to to institute, right? Is to sort of say, no, the government's only going to be this big, at least politically, uh, at least um um policy wise, right? We're not gonna mm -hmm. we're not gonna any on any issue, we're not gonna re regulate anywhere beyond this. Um, because it becomes the the regulation becomes self defeating, right? As what yes. Musk was talking about. Like if, if you have if, if there's no cost to imposing more regulation, then the regulation will be imposed at nos as nauseum. So right. suns like so sunset clauses and also the the trade off mechanism. Like we're not expanding mm -hmm. government for this. You actually, if you think this is valuable, you have to show me what is it more valuable than what we're already doing right <laughs> are you gonna you know are, are you gonna take that's away awesome. the yeah yeah and, that's awesome i think that that's that's a great insight mm -hmm. uh that's come out of this i appreciate that yeah and it's it's generally part of your life too because actually i mean i i've had the same problem just today um i mean so on, on my micro level of my life i've been uh, because i was sick partly but other things is like things built up and I realized, mm -hmm. like, just my like my office has gotten messy. My browser has gotten messy because I've had this process of of clinging on to things and like saying, "Oh, I'm going to deal with it later," or this is too worthy to let go of. And then I realized, no, I need a reductive process because now I'm I'm managing all this stuff that I'm never going to get to processing anyways, right? So I got to prioritize a couple things and let go of the rest because the the, even though I see the the hopes there, they're false hopes. It's it's the <laughs> dead one that needs to be get rid get rid of, right? That's a hard I mean, lesson to learn, man. Yeah, that's a skill and unto itself. That could be yeah. the that could be the the difference between success and failure. And it absolutely usually is. I mean, because because yeah. you get overwhelmed, you you get too many moving parts in, and then mm -hmm. you uh, uh you fail, right? So now, like, I'm just like that acceptance and going through that process. Today is like, nope, we're closing all these tabs. <laughs> buy browser tags <laughs> like they're not worried about yeah. that anymore and it's like that's such a great metaphor yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no so low 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 uh low stakes yeah <laughs> version of the high stakes thing yeah yeah that's yeah. awesome um yeah and then that that's sort of, and and then we're pricing these are the things i'm going to get to these weeks because this is i'm actually going to put time and energy into this right so and mm -hmm. this other stuff's got to go, even though it's cool and interesting. It's just weighing you down. Well, thank you for for putting time and energy into this. I appreciate yeah, that very I appreciate much. too, and I appreciate you uh, meeting me in the holidays with the holidays coming up and having this th this show. It's probably going to be airing next time uh, during the Christmas week. So that's yeah, awesome. nice present for people. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I hope so. Both of us. <laughs> so. Yeah. I just want right. to like uh, end with what I always say: residuum revertitur, viva Cristo Rey. Take care, my friend. Thank you. All right.